Hello, today I'm going to show you how to take the images that we created last week and import and edit them into Lightroom. And we're going to get started right now. Hello, my name is Carl Constantine. Welcome to my channel on macro photography where we make little things a big deal. If this is your first time here, please click that subscribe button ring that bell so you don't miss a single episode. If you're a returning visitor, thank you very much for joining me today. Today I'm going to show you how to use Lightroom to import the water drop images that we created last week and uh, be critical in terms of finding images that work, editing those images, and then exporting them for use into social media such as Facebook or Instagram or any other system that you want to use. I, this isn't going to be a tutorial on Lightroom itself, but I am going to show you a little bit about how I use Lightroom and my setup and configuration. There are plenty of tremendous tutorials on how to use Lightroom on YouTube, so do a quick search and uh, find what you need there. First things first, when I import my images into Lightroom, I take my card out of the camera and then use a card reader to actually import the images. Some systems have a built-in card reader. Mine doesn't, so I just use an external USB card reader because they're pretty inexpensive. The reason to do this is to hook your camera up to your workstation and then do the import in Lightroom that way. Just waste valuable battery life on your camera, and that's really not something you want. So just take the card out and import that way. It is much, much easier. So here we are in Lightroom. Let me give you a very quick tour. On the left hand side here is the Lightroom catalog imports. So these are all the images and sessions that I've imported previously in one catalog. If you use multiple catalogs in Lightroom, you will just see the current catalogs imports. In this case, I've only really been using one catalog this year. So I see all my imports throughout the year. On the right hand side, I see information about my image, the histogram, even including the settings I used. If I have some keywords, they are down here. I did not use any in this particular import, probably because I was just playing around and doing some testing, nothing really special. If I scroll down a little bit further, I see other information about this, uh, including those settings again, size, the date I took the image, and so forth. Down the bottom is a film strip like bar, which contains all the individual images from this session. I can display those either in a grid format like this or as individual images. For me personally, I like to view them as individual images. When you shoot your images, you should be using your camera's native RAW format. Not all cameras support a RAW format, but most modern DSLRs or mirrorless cameras actually have a RAW format. For me, Canon has a RAW format called CR2, which just basically stands for Canon RAW. So when you import those images into Lightroom, the most recent versions of Lightroom will copy those RAW files from your camera card and onto your computer's hard drive. After it's completed that, it will then convert those images to Adobe's DNG format. DNG just stands for Digital Negative Graphic. It's Adobe's own version of the RAW format. Now you might want to figure, you might ask yourself why Adobe does that. The simple reason is the Adobe DNG format on average is about 20% less space than the native RAW formats of most digital cameras. So you save yourself a bit of hard drive room in the process. So I'm going to import my images. And if I click on import here, my card will come up and show me all the images. And you can see here, 
It is in Adobe or a Canon RAW 2. It also gives me some information about the image when it was taken. In fact, it was seven days ago. And I see all the images here if I just scroll down the list. On the right hand side, I can change some information about this import. Some of the more critical things I want to do is I want to rename the files on import. This way it doesn't keep the image number format of most cameras. It also doesn't have an untitled file name. So I'm going to give it a very specific file name for this photo session. And in this case, I'm just going to call this Pluto Valve. Now you note down here below that, as I type that name, it shows me what each file name is going to be. It's going to be Pluto Valve, followed by a hyphen, followed by a four-digit numerical value, depending on how many images I have, and ultimately .dng on the end. And that is customizable. I'm going to start image numbering at one. I could start it at a different number if I import some images one time, go back, do some more uh, photography, and then import those images as part of the same session. I can start the numbering after the last file so that they all import directly. So you have some control over that. Down here, I'm going to input some generic keywords that I want to apply to all images on the import. So first of all, I'm going to say Pluto Trigger because we use the Pluto Trigger and Pluto Valve. I'm going to call this Water Collisions, Water Splash, Water Drops. And we're just going to leave it at that for now. If I want to add keywords later, after the files are imported, I can actually apply additional keywords to individual files as I see fit. Down here tells me where I want to import my files. Now I've organized my file system very similar to my Lightroom catalog. What I mean by that is, is on my computer, I have files on my D drive here, which is a separate hard drive from my main operating system, because my operating system drive is a solid state drive, which is very small. The other drive is a terabyte drive, so much, much more space. On that drive, I have a pictures folder, I then have some subfolders for different years of images, including the current year. And in there I have a folder which Adobe creates when I create a catalog. And I've named the catalog uh, Personal 2020 because it's all my personal photos from this year. And if I click on that, I can see all the files, folders, of all the previous images. So when I go to import, I choose that exact same location. It's on D, it's in pictures, it's in 2020, and it's in personal 2020. I've told uh, Lightroom that I want to import into a subfolder. And I name my folders based on the year, month, and day, because I'm Canadian. That's how we like to organize our date. A subject or a category for the folder, just so I can differentiate. In this case, I'm going to name it Pluto Valve Part 3, because this is Part 3 of this video series. And I'm going to highlight this folder. So it's going to go into a subfolder of Personal 2020 on import. Now I'm going to spare you the boring process of actually going through and doing the import, because if I try and talk while it's importing, uh, the audio will break up a little bit because my system is doing two things at once or four things at once. Um, 
and uh, I don't want that to happen. Now, if I look through this set of images, I see all kinds of images, including one of my focus tests, a few test shots that didn't work, and then I see my image. This check mark here indicates the images to import. Now, in this case, I'm going to spare myself the initial images. I'm going to click on the first one, click on that one, and uncheck those boxes because they don't really matter to me. They are just initial setup images. Now, there are several images in this shoot that are blank. They don't really show anything or they are completely black. In this case, I'm going to keep those images because those are visual indicators to me as to where I change settings in my Pluto trigger to get certain effects on the water drops. So I want to keep those as markers, excuse me, as that is very helpful. Normally, if I get a black image or an image that doesn't work out, I would just uncheck it and leave it alone. And I might uncheck a couple of these that didn't work because they are not important and leave others in. So those represent all the images I am going to import and I'll meet you back here momentarily. All right, here we are. All the images are uh, imported. So if we uh, take a look at them, by default, Lightroom presents these images in a big grid format after import. If I'm going to go through and delete images or critique images, make sure of images I want to keep, I'm actually going to go through on a single image format. So I can take a look at each individual image carefully. I can zoom into the images by clicking it and zoom back out again also just by clicking it. So I'm going to go through very very quickly and I'm going to flag some of the images I do not want to keep. Uh, so I tend to do that first, uh, remove all the images I don't want and then uh, delete them. So if I take a look, I don't mind that image. It's not great in focus, but it's kind of a cool image. In this image, I can't see the top. So if I hit X, that will flag it as a rejected image. And I can just, excuse me, if I can just use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move around, it's much easier than trying to click on a mouse all the time. Uh, again, can't see the full image, so I'm going to reject that. This one doesn't really appeal to me. That's somewhat interesting. I'm going to keep it. This, I believe, is a marker image, so I'm going to leave that there. I didn't really care for how that those ones looked, so I'm going to delete that. This one's kind of cool just because of the interesting shape. I don't care for that one. Don't really care for that one. Don't care for that one. Now we're getting it somewhere. A couple very cool images there. That one's off screen. This one might be interesting. I'm not going to keep that one. I'll take a closer look at that one. I then tried to do different things with food coloring and get some shots. This one didn't really work for me. This is not that interesting. This is kind of interesting. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep that. This one, not so much. This one, no, no. Again, I've got water uh, spouts going off the edge of the screen here, so I don't want those. So a lot of images in this case didn't really work, but that's okay. Did I do anything different there? I'm going to keep that one as a marker. All 
and I'm just going to go through very quickly. Even though this one's going off the screen, I'm going to keep this one just because it has a very interesting shape in here. And keep that one, delete that one. Again, I'm going to keep that one even though part of the image is going off screen. This is kind of a cool image. I like the way the color is inverted here in the water drop and in this water drop. I don't know if I'll edit it, but it is kind of an interesting image, so I'm going to keep that one. Ah, oh, now I have a choice between a couple. I'll keep that one too. Get rid of that one. That one didn't really work. That one didn't really work. So as you can see, there is a lot of rejected images in this case. That one would have been nice had the splash actually occurred more in frame. Sometimes the splashes occur really, really high. And you might find that if you reorient your camera to portrait mode instead of landscape mode, you might get more in frame. I'm leaving this one in as a marker. And here we're starting to get some more consistent collisions. So even though some of these are uh, out of frame, I'm going to keep them here for now. I might not edit them most likely, but they are interesting in terms of just marking a particular progress. Keep that one. that one. So now what I'm going to do is down here in the bottom right hand corner I have a series of filters and what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter based on all the flagged images. Now right now nothing is showing because I don't have any picked images. So I want to filter based on the images that are rejected. So that brings up all these images here. And you can see they are gray. They're kind of dim in the film strip. I'm going to select all of them just by hitting Control A, Command A on a Mac. And then I'm going to right click on one of them. It doesn't really matter and I'm going to say remove photos. I now have the option of just deleting them from the catalog but keeping the files. Because these images don't work, I'm actually going to delete them from the disk, period. Recover that disk space, just get rid of them, you don't want them. All right. Now I'm going to turn my filters off again, and that leaves me with all the images that I might want to edit here. Let's just take a look at the first one. Even though the image is not that in focus, if I zoom into it, it is an interesting image. You have to ask yourself when you're looking at images, uh, is this something that's going to be printed and mounted on a wall? In which case, I wouldn't bother editing this image because it's out of focus. Is it going to go onto social media like a Facebook page or Instagram page or possibly even a personal website as long as the image isn't too big? I might want to edit that image. I would definitely prefer an image that's a little bit more in focus. But for the process of this video, we're going to edit this image anyway. So over here in the uh, top corner, there is a series of various tabs here in Lightroom. If we go over to the Develop tab, that expands this 
side here, which gives us access to a whole lot of controls and effects that we have for our image. Now by default, I tend to boost the clarity on the image, which sharpens some of the minute details on it, which is really good for water drop photography. So I'm going to increase that a little bit here. See if we can't get something that looks pretty good. I tend to ignore the texture on these. I can play a little bit with the exposure, making this a little bit brighter or a little bit darker. In this case, I think my exposure is pretty good, so I'm just going to leave it alone. I can play with highlights in here, which are things like the reflection of the flash and reduce that a little bit or increase it. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. Whites, which give me an overall look to the image just because that this is clear water. And this background while gray is actually white when I shot it. So I can play with those settings. I'm actually going to leave those alone here for this image. One slider I like to play with a little bit is the dehaze. Dehaze is actually designed for landscape photographers. If they get uh, an image in the far distance, sometimes you get a little bit of haze in the sky and it's designed to kind of help filter that out of your image. But sometimes you can get some pretty cool effects by playing with it. So if I adjust this slide a little bit, if I bring it back, it actually makes my image more hazy and actually almost completely grays it right out. If I do it the other way, I actually get a little bit more contrast to my image, which is actually pretty, pretty cool. So it darkens parts of this image, leaves the white parts alone. And now in this case, I can see a little bit more detail in my image. I have, if I take a look, I actually have some sensor dust in my image. Here, there, there, over here, and I can see that. As it happens, actually, after I shot this, I cleaned my camera uh, sensor with a special cleaning kit from Visible Dust. I'll put a link to them in the description below. I do recommend looking at that and cleaning your sensor if you have this problem. A lot of cameras have a built-in self-cleaning mechanism, but it's only so good. Some bits of dust and oil stick to the image anyway, regardless of what you do. So I'm going to remove these bits of sensor dust. If I go over here to the spot removal tool, I can click on that and I can adjust the size either by using this slider here. You notice my cursor gets a little bit bigger. I can also use the bracket keys on my keyboard to do the same thing. These are the same adjustments and keyboard uh, shortcuts that you can use in Photoshop. Let me say a real quick word about Photoshop before we continue. I really highly recommend photographers of any genre use Lightroom and Photoshop. You can get them as a package deal very inexpensively. There are many different uh, cataloging type tools and raw editors out there. Uh, I use Lightroom. It works well for me. And because it comes packaged with Photoshop, it's actually a really, really good deal. I tend to do a lot of main adjustments here in Lightroom. And when you're dealing with macro images, most of the editing, you don't need to go any further than Lightroom. For some finer detail, uh, particularly with some finer detail spot removal, I might take that image into Photoshop because it does give me a lot more granular control 
over my image. And at which point, instead of using my mouse to do things, I actually have a Wacom tablet that I use. And these come in different sizes. You don't need anything really big. Uh, I have this left over from a lot of my portrait work and retouching that I've uh, done previously as well. Um, but the most part, I can just do most everything I need for macro images right here in Lightroom. So I've got the spot removal tool highlighted here. I'm just going to move the cursor over the spot. I want to have the cursor just a little bit bigger than the spot I'm removing. And I'm just going to click on it once and Lightroom will automatically try and find a spot that is similar in terms of brightness and texture to replace the spot I clicked. Now I've got a couple more spots here. There's one there that I can do. There is a small one right here. I'm going to adjust the size of my brush, make it a little bit smaller. Make that smaller there. Get that one over here. And I'm going to take a couple spots out that are smaller again. If I zoom in to the image, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, oops, let's not click that tool. I'm just going to go back to the library. If I zoom in on the image, Lightroom will kind of uh, resize the image for me. And I can get a little bit more granular detail. So I'm going to go back to the develop module. Click on my adjustment brush here. I also have a wayward drop off in the frame. I'm actually going to remove that just so it's not a distracting element in my image. And a couple other minor spots here. If I hold the space bar down, I can click and drag my image around and take a look at more detail in this image. Now with the sheer number of spots in this image, I'm tempted to bring this into Photoshop. This spot here is actually a line. I can click and drag that line. And Lightroom again will try and replace that spot with a similar location. There's a small spot here. I have a bit of a line in here. I'm just going to highlight that and take that out. I'm just going to take a look around the image overall. In this corner over here, I can see sort of what is called a loop view. So it shows me where I am over all in the image. And I want to take a look along all the edges and borders what uh, Stuart Wood likes to call border patrol because often we miss little artifacts along the border of the image here. All right, I'm just going to take that off. I wanted to keep these here because this is a bit of a reflection and the small dots over here aren't really going to be seen. 
Now the other thing I can do is I can adjust the color temperature of this image. I can make it a little bit cooler, apply a bluer tone to the image. I can adjust the vibrance of this so that those colors pop a little bit more. You tend to want to be very careful. You don't want to overdo it because that's the look you get and that is most likely not what you want. Good recommendation is small adjustments, not big adjustments. Particularly when you're playing with things such as saturation, you can go too much very, very easily, or I can completely make this a black and white image. I'm only going to pop the saturation just a titch. I have some further editing controls in terms of the tone curve, kind of like curves in Photoshop, but a little bit less powerful. I can adjust a very specific color in my image. I can also adjust additional sharpening. By default, Lightroom does some sharpening for you, but I can increase that a little bit if I want. Very similar to sharpening in Photoshop. If you use Photoshop a lot, you will kind of know how to use this. But these are very, very basic adjustments. Additionally, if I have some Lightroom presets here, uh, there are a bunch that come with Lightroom. I can scroll over any one of these and take a look at the result. And those, might, those presets might change some of the values I've selected over here. So be aware that if you use presets in your images, they may undo some of the work you did. This one's not too bad. I can apply a vignette to the image very, very easily. I can even apply some of Stuart's presets. Take a look at them. In this case, none of them really work for water drops. The cross process here isn't bad. I'm going to select that as my image. Now moving along, let's go to this image right here, which is one of the first collisions that we got. Again, if I take a large look overview here, I see a couple spots that are large that I might want to edit out. This looks like a stray water drop that was pretty far out of focus, a little bit back in the bowl. This one's a little bit closer, so you can see it a little bit clearer. I'm going to remove both of these very, very quickly. And again, I can take a look and I can see some sensor dust. You may not be able to see that immediately on the image, so let me just zoom in here. and scroll around the image. So I see a sensor dust spot there. And a couple very small spots there. Again, you want to edit depending on the purpose that you're going to use the image. Are you just going to show it on the internet? Are you going to print it for your wall or for someone else's wall? Maybe for a gallery, if you want to display your images in a local gallery. 
and again I'm just taking a look all around the border of my image to see if I can see anything that looks out of the ordinary sensor dust things I might want to crop out So the borders look okay. I'm going to take another look inside here. I don't want to touch the main splash here really unless I see some sensor dust in the image because part of the look of the splash is what is appealing. You get a little bit of shadowing here based on how the light hits um, and highlights based on how the light hits. Sometimes it's good to edit those out, sometimes it's not. It's really to your taste. And I don't see anything else really standing out at me here. So I'm going to come off my adjustment brush. And I'm going to zoom back out on the image. And here again is where I want to do some minor adjustments. Actually, is that a... No, that's actually a dirt spot on my monitor. So now I want to do some minor adjustments on this image. So once again, I'm going to increase the clarity a little bit to try and sharpen up some of the fine details in along these lines here and around the edges. I'm going to play a little bit with the dehaze to give me a little bit of contrast and I actually kind of like that. That reduces a lot of the gray in the background and makes the contrast a little bit better making my splash more clear. So I really like that particular look. I'm going to adjust the vibrance here just a little bit. the saturation just a tad let me see what happens if I increase this a little bit more and I'm going to adjust the temperature to make the water just a little bit more blue mainly just so it's not so clear and again all these adjustments are to your personal taste there are no real hard and fast rules about any of this at all. And once again, I might take a real quick look through some additional presets, some of the Lightroom defaults here. I kind of like that one and I see in this process that actually one of the bit of sensor dust is still in the image so I'm going to go and take that out you might find sometimes once you increase the contrast of your image you see a little bit more now down here in the bottom I actually see the edge of the reservoir I used for the water drop. I want to crop that out. So I'm going to go over here to the crop tool and I'm going to scroll up from the middle. Now what this does, you will notice, is it crops all around the image in equal amounts here. I can adjust this a little bit if I want to move the image around. Let's crop out a little bit more. It tries to maintain a particular aspect ratio, which over here is the original aspect ratio. I can adjust this if I want 
to a very particular format. So I can go one to one, really good if I want to export to Instagram. I can go to a particular four by five, eight by 10 look, eight and a half by 11, which is sort of a loose leaf size here in North America, five by seven, two by three, and so on and so forth, and even a full 16 by nine. I'm just going to keep the resolution or the aspect ratio at the default. I can adjust this image so that more of it is in the center. Or I can put it more off to the side here. In this case, I actually kind of want to bring this in further. and have a little bit less negative space at the top of the image. And then I'm going to click Done. Now, once again, I see a stray dot over here that I missed, so I'm just going to edit that out. And this gives me a much, much better image. Let's do one more really quick. Uh, let's see. I want to do one of these splashes here. Or do I want to do one of these splashes here? Let's take a look at this one because I see the full splash in the image. So once again, take a look at the image as a whole. I'm not seeing the dust spots from my sensor quite as easily. And that's mainly because that there is a color applied to the background here. I taped a orange sheet and green sheet of uh, construction paper to my background. So I get those reflections in the image. So if I zoom in on the image, oops, and take a greater look around, I see a spot here. So I'm going to get rid of that. I see some stray spots here. Most likely this isn't uh, sensor dust, it might be a stray splash. It might be sensor dust. Either way, I'm just going to click on it quickly and get rid of it. This one is definitely a stray splash because I can see it a little bit more clearly. Here's a stray splash. I'm just going to get rid of that. There's a little bit of sensor dust. taking a look at the border of the image first because it is such a neglected area. And once again, I'm just holding down the space bar on my computer here and then mousing around the image. There's another water spot or a sensor dust spot rather all right now let's take a gander here in the image itself now some of these little spots in this one you can edit out or leave in depending on the look you want. I'm going to edit a couple of these out and leave a couple in, mainly just the ones I think are a little distracting. Or that look more like sensor dust instead of artifacts of the bubbles in the water. Uh, 
that looks like a little bit of sensor dust. I remember seeing some sensor dust in parts of images in previous images. Little bit reflection spot there. I'm just going to get rid of that. Now here, this spot here will be really hard to edit in Lightroom without it looking a little funny just because of the uh, multicolored area here. So I'm actually just going to leave that in. Part of the reason is when I zoom out, it's actually not really going to be visible. I'm going to edit out this spot here because it's a bit distracting. There we go. All right, let's play a little bit once again with uh, some clarity just to fine tune some of the fine edges. I don't think I need to do anything with the haze because with the added color, it actually doesn't do anything for me. So if I double click it, that resets it to default. I can play a little bit with exposure. No, that looks all good. Highlights are fine. Whites are fine. Blacks are fine. I can lift the shadows a little bit, but I kind of like them the way they are. I can play the vibrance here a little bit just to make some of that color pop just a little more. And just a hint of saturation. I don't really want to touch the saturation too much. Now in this case, I'm not going to bother applying any Lightroom presets because it has color in it. I want to pop that just a little. I think I might adjust the exposure a touch just to brighten the overall image. I think that looks good. The one thing I might want to do is play with some of the vignetting here to focus attention a little bit more on that spot. But actually I noticed the spot is a little off center. So I'm going to crop here just a little. Bring that more in line. I think that looks good. And then I'm going to apply a light vignette to that image. Alrighty. Now down here in the bottom, I can see which images I've edited because there is a small flag here that says the photo has develop adjustments. I'm just going to click on that image and I'm going to rate it. I'm just going to give it a one star rating. Again, you can learn more about ratings and whatnot. I must have hit the wrong key there somewhere. Why is that doing that? I don't want to do that. I'm going to use the one on my keyboard there instead. 
And then just going to use this as a way to flag which images that I've edited. Now I can turn the filters on and show only the rated images so that I can export them. I'm going to highlight all three of these images. just by using the shift key. And if I hover over any one of them and click export, I can now export the images. Now Lightroom has a few presets for exporting. I've also developed a bunch of my own. I'm not gonna go too much into detail about the custom presets, because again, this isn't a full Lightroom tutorial. There are plenty of good tutorials out on YouTube for that sort of thing. I'm going to select one of my presets, which puts my logo down the bottom right hand corner of the image and exports it to a folder called JPEG in the same folder as my images. So if I go over here to my file system, and click where I put the files. There is a folder called JPEGs here. And if I click on that, it has my edited images, which when I view, put my logo down here and I can just take a look at them. So once my images are all edited and exported, I can then upload them to whatever source I wish to use. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you like and subscribe down below. If you want to see this series from the very beginning, make sure you click this playlist up here, subscribe and share this video. And remember that in the macro world, we make little things a big deal. And I'll see you next time.